right. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I want to I want to welcome you here today uh, to join our monthly lunch and learn uh, at the Center for Sustainable Journalism. We certainly wish that we could have everyone centered around our conference room table, sharing some food and and beverage and meeting. But, uh, really happy to have everybody join us here virtually today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Center for Sustainable Journalism publishes. Uh, several publications, two of which are nationally recognized, Youth Today and Juvenile Justice Information Exchange. Um, you know, those really focus on, you know, some marginalized youth and marginalized populations um, and, you know, some some child welfare issues and out of school time and, and foster care and uh, have a longstanding reputation here at the center. We also have a photography platform, Boca Focus, which focuses on young photographers and really working to get their work recognized um, on, on just to a, a much broader audience. Um, and we're in the beginning stages of launching um, a, a new news organization, a local and state reporting uh, publication that works with students here at Kennesaw State um, to get valuable experiential learning opportunities through our center and start learning more about how to report on our own local and state government. And um, as you know, during a global pandemic and an election and civil unrest, these issues are more important today than they've ever been, um, which is why we've brought Greg Bluestein to the table today to talk to us about his work at the AJC. He's a reporter at uh, his hometown newspaper and has really just an resume of work in this space. Um, way back to uh, your education um, at the University of Georgia, uh, and it looks like Chips at the Savannah Morning Street Journal and, and the AJC um, and, and came to press uh, as an intern as well and then spent many years at the press covering the state legislature has been over at the AJC since 2012 um, and really uh, he's paying attention to state politics uh, you know, in Georgia, and they're not following Greg's work, they're missing out on one of really the, the subject experts. So we're super grateful to have you station today. We'll hear you think the, um, no, no! the key points of the election are, uh, but I'm gonna see you quick and then we'll move on to our conversation with Greg. Cool. And it looks like we got hacked for a little while, but I hope <laughs> it looks like that's done. That's a first for me. Yes. I've certainly been on lots of Zoom calls where, where that's happened. Um, when we have open yeah, events for, like this, we sometimes get bombed a little bit. So uh, we have okay. to drop the people off, but we're good. I've been at court hearings and stuff where that's happened. So it's certainly a part of the uh, my kids' Hebrew school classes that's happened, unfortunately. So it is what it is. Uh, there are some weird people out there. Um, but uh, no, it's great to be here. Um, I want, have wanted to be just a little bit about uh, my background and my history. I've wanted to be a journalist since I.J. Rosenberg, the Atlanta Braves beat writer for the Atlanta Journal, um, came to speak to my fourth grade class. And it was the year the Braves went worst to first. So I like fell in love with the idea of being a sports reporter, wanted to be the next I.J. Rosenberg and cover the Braves. I'm still a huge Braves fan. But that day I went home to my mom and told her my big plan. And she said, well, there's a big cog in it. You have to learn how to type to be a reporter. So I said, I'll do something easier. I'll be a doctor. So I don't know, for like the next seven years, I figured I wanted to be a, a physician. And in high school, I had a rude awakening when I got like twos and all my AP physics and AP chemistry exams, but got fives on, you know, my AP English and AP history stuff. So someone was trying to tell me something. And um, my junior year, my girlfriend slash best friend, I was over at her house and in high school and um, and her dad comes running down and says, it's all hands on deck at CNN where he worked. Um, Do you guys want to come with me? And, you know, my Jessica kind of rolled her eyes and I said, yeah, let's go. And it was the night of um, bombings in Kosovo. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't remember what exactly what about the, that night kind of triggered me, but it, it, uh, it rekindled my passion for wanting to be a journalist. And um, I joined the North Springs High School Oracle after that. Um, and then right when I got to UGA, I joined the Red and Black, which is the independent daily student newspaper. It used to be daily, now it's weekly, but still. Publishes all the time online. And um, kind of went head first into all this fun. Hello. Um, hello. Um, and I got to cover um, Brian Kemp. Um, 
from uh, really, you know, it's funny because like the people I'm covering now, um, a lot of them, or at least their roots to it from, from my time at UGA. And it goes back to one of my famous professors said, um, his name is Conrad Fink. And he's legendary. He was a former AP reporter and vice president and all this stuff. Um, and he called me into the office one day and he, he told me he had this deep growl. And he goes, Bluestein, the people you're covering now, you'll be covering when you're a pro. Uh, and he was right. Like I covered Brian Kemp's state Senate run in 2002 at the Rim Block. Um, I sat next to people in my poli sci class with Charles Bullock, who are now state lawmakers and statewide candidates for office. Um, my advisor's name was Kate Carter, and her husband, Jason Carter, uh, ran for governor in 2014 and is still a major player on the Democratic stage. And Republicans, who I see, Chuck F. Strachan, who's a representative over in Tequila, who's a, who's a rising star in the Republican Party, used to sit two or three you know, seats down for me. So it's been really neat kind of, um, you know, covering folks that who I have, uh, and, and not just student journalists, but also students who want to get involved in other facets of politics, whether it be um, uh, ground game stuff, or other being, or whether it be dealing with the media. Um, because I, I always say this to classes, there's a very thin from both parties, uh, especially the Democratic side, among like, homegrown talent. Um, a lot of times we're going to have to go outside the state and go hire folks. And who knows? Georgia better than people in the school here who grew up here. Um, and so I would start writing for student paper right now. I'd start getting involved. If you want to get involved in campus, start volunteering for local candidates. But the, the fun thing about where you guys are is, is the suburbs are the battleground in Georgia. Um, there have been story after story after story written about that. And um, it is the most competitive part of Georgia. And in Cobb County, of course, was a Republican stronghold uh, seemed like forever. Um, it, it was a joke that Democrats could compete there until 2016 when Hillary Clinton flipped it in 2018 where Stacey Abrams built on that, um, on those numbers there. Um, and and now in 2020, there are a, a ton of, there's a, about a dozen competitive, it seems like um, competitive down ticket legislative races in Cobb County and of course, congressional um, campaign of Lucy McBath there. Um, in 2017, three years ago, Georgia was the national political story for about three months with the race between John Ostoff and Karen Handel. The beauty of this fall is it's our backyard. You don't have to go to Ohio. You don't have to go to New Hampshire. You don't have to go to, you know, Florida to go cover these stories. Um, Cause that, that's my experience. I had to, in 2016, there was no really big, there was important things happening in Georgia, of course, but there was no, the campaigns were seriously contesting Georgia, neither Hillary Clinton nor Donald Trump. So I was flying around the nation covering all this stuff. And in 2017, I lived in nobody. And in 2017, I could literally walk to major, huge events happening right around the corner from my house. You know, a debate at Dunwoody High School or, or Karen Handel's speech at the Starbucks across the street from where I live. One of the candidates in the jewelry shop um, like a mile from my house. So it was very weird for me having gone traveling the nation to kind of the nation's political uh, mines in, in my backyard. Of course, things have only gotten tighter since then. That district that John Ossoff lost by points in 2017, a Democrat won by a handful of points um, in, in 2018, and there's a rematch going on. And so all these stories, all these things happening are stories that students can just jump into right now. You don't, you don't need to have the access. You don't need to have some you know, the AJC sanction you, you can go cover these stories right now. There, one of the most interesting things about the campaign trail this year is there's a, um, there's like a 20, a 22, 23 year old student who shows up at everything. Um, he has a, has a, a camera. I think he's shooting freelance for a local weekly outlet. And he shows up, he was at the President Trump's visit two Fridays ago. He was at Mike Pence's last Wednesday. Um, he was at John Ossoff's event yesterday. And all it takes sometimes is just, you know, showing up, um, wanting the passion for reporting and, um, and the story ideas. And you just pitch because there are, there are fewer people like me than, than ever before. And what I say is like people who are covering this professionally. Um, our press corps from when I got here in, in, after I graduated from UGA in 2004, um, the press corps at the Capitol was huge. There was three reporters for the, 
for, for the Augusta Chronicle. There were reporters from Macon Health from Boston Times and, and Columbus Ledger Inquirer and from the Chattanooga Times Free Press and, and all sorts of reporters from all over the state um, down in Atlanta. And now most of those bureaus are long gone. There's only a handful of reporters down at the Capitol Press Corps, which means there's more room for people, um, especially with diverse viewpoints and with uh, different lenses on what to cover, right? I mean, your students will have much different views of what's happening in Cobb County or the presidential race or the Senate races uh, than I will. Uh, they'll look at it through the lens of someone who's younger. They'll look at it through the lens of someone who looks differently, all that. And all that's super important to how uh, we as a, as a society um, analyze and digest what's happening out there. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Greg. Um, I was going to say, there's. I see a couple students on here that are shaking their heads, saying like, "Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying." I want to let them know to to send Chelsea some questions in our chat uh, in our chat box, so that we're going to leave some time at the end for you to ask uh, Greg some specific questions as it pertains to your education and 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 just what you're learning through this lunch and learn. Um, Perfect. You know, playing off that, I wonder. If you were going to tell our students today, what's the most important story they should go jump on right now? You just named about 20 possible storylines in the state of Georgia. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, how do you even know where to go, you know, each morning, you know, without trying to cover everything at once? But advice specifically to a student, what's the key storyline that you would recommend they follow leading up to November election? So the hard lesson that I learned at the, at the Red and Black at UGA was you write for your audience. Um, and I say this because at the Red and Black, I was writing, it was, I was, I was there um, doing September 11th. Um, and so I got really obsessed with, um, with national security and domestic, domestic terrorism and, and international terrorism and all these other storylines. So I'd write these like stories for the front page of the Daily Paper interviewing university professors about war in Afghanistan. And it took one of my professors to pull me aside saying, hey, you know, you, you did it right. You, you interviewed UGA professors about what was happening in the Middle East or Asia or wherever, and it was a good story, but no one's reading. I mean, people people want to know about their own backyards. Um, and so I realized, and it took me a while, but I realized that my audience was the UGA community. And so I shifted to write about like politics in Athens and, 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 and really like around University of Georgia. So I wrote a lot about the SGA and it's boring, but like that's how you get your start, right? I wrote about how a student senator, a student government senator wasn't actually a student and got him kicked out of the SGA. I wrote about funding debates in, in the SGA over, over like a bus service that no one in Athens ever used. Um, and then I wrote about local elections and that's how I got to know Brian Kemp, you know, 18 years ago for the first time, interviewing him about his, what seemed like a long shot bid for state senate against a Democrat named Doug Haynes back when Democrats ran the state. Um, and it also let me go write about cool statewide stories. I mean, I was at the party where Sonny Perdue, his election victory party, when Sonny Perdue defeated Roy Barnes in a in a crazy long shot victory, right? It was the national story of the night in, in 2002. And I, there I was um, phoning stories then for not only the red and black, but also the Associated Press. It was one of, one of the cool moments. Um, and so, you, so, you know, you, you have that ability to just jump in and, and, and view those things through your lens. And, and my lens as a red and black reporter was the student population of the University of Georgia. My lens as an AJC reporter is the state. Metro Atlanta is, is where you know a lot of most of our readers are, but it's state politics. Um, so there are stories that I can't write. You know, there are stories that like just I have to pass on. Uh, they're great stories, but they're you know, happen outside of the state borders, or they're not really a, a, a statewide or a Metro Atlanta audience. And then there are stories that are like right up my alley, but I never have pitched at my old job at the Associated Press because they're they're too local. Um, I, and that all being said, I think there's there's a couple stories that students can just jump all over. One of them is is going to be um, the, one of the biggest stories in Georgia going forward, and and that's voting issues, um, ballot access, uh, long lines at the polls. All these issues uh, we're giving a keen eye to um, on a on a statewide basis. How how Georgia and in a citywide basis, how Metro Atlanta is getting ready for elections after the disastrous June primaries, where some people were waiting in line for five, six, seven hours and still couldn't vote. Um, this is all happening in Cobb County too. This is all happening in your backyards. Um, and the second thing is, as important as the presidential races, um, 
I had to make the decision pretty early in my own sort of like metric system. Uh, coming into this, I was like, okay, I'll be putting the David Purdue in the presidential race. You know, I'll, I'll be trying to cover them, with, you know, getting a front page story about each of them in and every week. Well, once Johnny Isaacson decided to retire, that meant we had two open U.S. Senate seats uh, up for grabs uh, in November. And I had to break, t- tell my editors, presidential race is hugely important, and I really want to be out there and going to all those cool places I did in 16. But, like, we've got these crazy races here that no one else, you know, that, that, that like, that we have the ability to cover uh, in a way that, that few other outlets can. Um, so I, I've, you know, shifted um, to do a lot of reporting on that. I'm still covering, of course, a lot of Trump Clinton stuff, but but I had to make that calculation internally at the AJC um, to cover a ton of US Senate stories. And I think I had like five yesterday alone, right? Um, so your students can dive into that because these debates are happening statewide, but they're also happening on the KSU campus. They're happening in Cobb County. They're just happening on a local basis um, uh, all the time. And um, uh, I think those are some stories, you know, how, how the university population is gauging those debates, where people are leaning. All those are sh- hugely important stories that, uh, that you can tell in a way that no one else can tell. So those, those are the two top stories I jump on. Of course, presidential there's there's all sorts of other issues that are that are up for grab. There's really close, you know, commission races in Cobb County and things like that, and debates over healthcare and issues, and all those are also very important. But like those two, kind of take the cake for me. Greg, you mentioned um, you know the the two U.S. Senate seats that are up for grabs, and and you'd written to me earlier that you you could see possibly two runoffs in January. And I believe you spoke on your podcast about record-breaking fundraising for those races, upwards of 150 million in one of the races. You want to talk about just um, just the the importance of those two races and how they play out for the majority control of the Senate. And you've talked a little bit about why they're just so important for the state of Georgia now. But can you elaborate a little bit on just the fundraising and how the national picture of those two races plays out? Yeah, and just as a quick rundown. Uh, in Georgia, you need a majority of the vote in order to win an election outright. So if, if no one gets a majority of the vote, um, there's a runoff in, in January between the two top vote getters. It almost happened in 2018 between Abrams and, and Kemp. Abram, uh, Governor Kemp got a majority of the vote by about, uh, he beat Abrams by 55,000 votes, but he peaked over a majority by about 20 or 30,000 votes. So this close to having a runoff in the governor's race, there were runoffs in several other statewide races. But that's what makes Georgia so intriguing nationally this this cycle because uh, there's one race for Senator Kelly Leffler's seat where there's 21 different candidates who qualified to run. There'll be about 20 on the ballot. Uh, one's, one's already dropped out, but he'll still be on the ballot. Um, and that race is almost 100% going, I and mean, 99.9999% going to run off. There's just too many candidates on the ballot siphoning votes from each other. Um, it would be a stunner if it's not if, if it doesn't go to rough. Um, and that means the entire political world, we thought that the John Ossoff, Karen Handel race got a lot of attention. We'll have the entire political world watching the runoff between Kelly Leffler, Doug Collins, Raphael Warnock, one of two of those three um, just battering each other. Um, and what might be at stake is control of the US Senate. Uh, we're not sure how that will go out go right now, but there's lots of different um, modeling and maps out there that show that Georgia, the two U.S. Senate seats in Georgia, uh, could come down to that wire and could 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 to control uh, decide control of the U.S. Senate. And the other race is just as important. Uh, and that's between that's the more conventional race between David Perdue and John Ossoff. Um, there's only three candidates in that race. Shane Hazel, Libertarian, is also in that contest. So um, there's less of a likelihood of a runoff, but Poll after poll shows those two are like Purdue and Ossoff are at 47, 45, or 46, 48. So very close. And I don't think I've seen a single poll yet that shows either one of them above 50%. Um, So the folks I'm talking to point to a rising likelihood of a runoff in that contest too. So another unique position for all of us to be in. And a reminder that like people always kind of joke to me after elections, like, oh, now you can go on vacation. But elections, notwithstanding this year, because it's not going to be election night, it'll be election week this year anyway. Um, I doubt we'll have a result by Wednesday or Thursday of, the, uh, of, of races in Georgia or maybe even nationally. Um, but beyond that, 
we're not going to be done in Georgia until January um, because of those, those, those one, maybe two runoffs. That might be a good time to remind our, our budding journalists here that, you know, you'll probably be working during the holidays and nights and weekends from November through January. And that's the uh, that's kind of how this business goes. When when news breaks, you got to be a part of it. Um, yep. I'm going to I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball for a minute, um, which I, I know isn't fair and I don't expect to have a, a real answer from it. But. You know, there's so much being written about Georgia, you know, flipping this year, and there's so much being written about the purple suburbs. And I think you, you'd use the analogy of a knife's edge. It's so close, uh, the, the, the razor thin margins and, and mm -hmm. you know, just how closely the state is deadlocked. If you had to guess based on what you've seen, um, how do you see these races going from president on down? Is this going to be a historic election yeah, for Georgia? Uh, yeah, I spent a lot of my time talking to, to operatives and analysts about this stuff, too. Like, just just help inform my coverage, too. And there's a few reasons why Georgia's so much closer this year and what points to it. And, like, you know, we've written stories. I, I'd write about how Democrats want to turn Georgia into a battleground in 2014. And, and, like, the quotes I get from Republicans were like, yeah, right, bring it on, you know. Um, after Stacey Abrams' narrow defeat in 2018, their quotes changed. I went to an event in early 2019 with David Perdue up in Rome, Georgia, up in Northwest Georgia. And Perdue goes to the stands for the crowd, looks around and says, I got to tell you, November was a wake up call. We've got to get on it as Republicans. We've got to we've got to lock down the state. We, we can't we can't take things for granted anymore. It, it really was a real wake up call for Republicans. And this year, you're not seeing people, Republicans laugh off those polls. They're not dismissing them like you've seen in the past. They're saying that Georgia really is close. And the best indication you have of that is the fact that Vice President Pence was here Wednesday and President Trump was here two Fridays ago and three of his four children were here um, you know, in the last two or three weeks. And Donald Trump Jr. was supposed to come here yesterday, but but because of the coronavirus diagnosis from his father, he decided to stay home. Um, at this point in the campaign, Time is as precious as money. It's, both these campaigns have obscene amounts of money they're spending on TV airwaves. So it's their personal time they're spending in, in these states that tells a lot. And the fact that Donald Trump has had to, to come here and send his top surrogates here um, in the past two or three weeks shows you just how on the defense that he is. And that's that's my long wind up to just say, um, I think Trump still has the edge but I do believe every poll that shows a neck and neck race in Georgia with very few undecideds. Um, there are some indications that those undecideds lean Republican. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that shakes up. But like the AJC poll that we, that we published, I don't know, two weeks ago, couldn't be closer, 47-47 in Georgia. Um, so things are very tight here. Um, I will add this about runoffs in Georgia. Um, Dem Democrats are at a disadvantage historically with runoffs. Republicans tend to win, win um, statewide runoffs over the last decade. And they also won that congressional runoff against Karen Hanna and John Ossoff in 2017 um, because it's just a different electorate. It's a smaller electorate, more, not that much smaller, but it tends to be a smaller electorate, more, more politically motivated, which can get, bring out Georgia. Um, but all bets are off in the runoff because there'll be there'll be so much attention, especially if it's if control of the U.S. Senate's at stake. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> what a nightmare we're about to go through as Georgians turning on the TV and seeing a gazillion ads every five seconds. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, I want to kind of pivot over to Chelsea for a moment. Um, I have about 20 other questions I could talk to you for the rest of the day about, but I, I know that the students are dropping in some really uh, great questions. I see some other questions from the audience, so I want to leave plenty of time. I can circle back if there's anything remaining, but Chelsea, you want to you know lead us down our question list and, and get some of those uh, answered? Yes, thank you all so much. So Greg, I'll get us started with some questions that are coming in the chat and you feel free to answer them as, as, you, as you wish. Uh, so the first one um, came in from Stella Simonton. Um, Stella is curious about Greg's take on the biggest challenges he faces in covering politics right now. 
Uh, that's easy because it's the pandemic. Um, it's I have two. I have a fourth grader and a first grader upstairs in my house right now as I'm speaking. My wife works at Emory Midtown, so she's at she's at the hospital every morning working. Um, so it's been balancing um, covering a very crazy busy campaign season while also virtual school, um, kids always around. It's weird because as a dad, you always feel, and, and with, a, with a pretty busy job, you always are like, okay, you're always feeling like you're making a sacrifice. Like you're either around your kids a lot and not working as much or working more, but not around your kids as much. I'm working more than ever. I'm around my kids more than ever, but I don't feel like I'm doing either one, a, a good job at either one of them, which I think is like probably how 95% of America's workforce feels in some form or fashion right now. We're all balancing things. We're all doing Zoom calls like this, worried about our kids barging at any moment to say something. Um, we're all working crazy hours because there's no distinction right now between, not that there was much in journalism before, but there's even less right now between work life. Um, I'm, I'm, I normally get like, I'm used to getting late texts and late calls and late, late things from different operatives and, and all over. But now there's like, there's even more. Um, I feel like emails just gone off the chain. Um, I, pe people are around their computers more. So they're just emailing more than ever before. I don't know. It's just, there's, there's, it's, it, there's a lot to, um, to process. And I think part of it too, is like, I'm used to being out there on a campaign trail. I'm used to going out and going to events and going to see the candidates and then bugging them afterwards for stories I'm working on and then getting to see them in action. And up until recently, there wasn't much to go cover. I mean, Republicans hit the campaign trail again back in June, um, but only to a very limited degree. It's only been real recently where Republicans are, um, are, are have been having you know regular events and Democrats just like in the last two or three weeks have been back at it. And like, as great as it is that there's virtual calls and virtual press conferences and online Instagram live chats and all that, it gets old <laughs> covering these guys when I'm used to just being able to, I, you know, one of the best things about my job is going to Columbus, going to a random, you know, town in Atkinson County um, to like talk to voters and seeing how camp candidates are doing on the stump. Um, and I just, you know, you haven't had the ability to do that. So it's been a lot harder covering these things remotely. And I think it's part two of that is just the glut of great stories and great races in Georgia. I always feel like um, we're not doing them, we're trying, but we're not doing them justice. Like if you think about how many stories were written about, uh, you know, uh, the Ossoff handle race in 17 or the Abrams Kemp race in 18, when you had like one big race dominating the cycle, now you've got Two, three giant races plus like very a bunch of other very important races dominating in Georgia. You've got president, you've got both Senate races, and then one little notch below, you've got six and seven congressional districts, which are super important as well. So that's been a um, that's been part of the uh, the challenge here. Is like like I tell my editors, and and by the way, we're all also covering the pandemic. Every reporter in the AJC is also like a science reporter too. So I have to, you know, I sprinkle in pandemic stories about Governor Kemp's response and all that, um, which dominated the first part of the year and still is, of course, still a hugely important story, as well as the protests for racial justice over the summer. So you add all that mixed together, it's been, it's been um, a quite a challenging year to try to <laughs> cover all this stuff. Thank you for your honest feedback on that. That's really great to understand your insight and what you're going through to make sure that we have the coverage we need to know what's going on. Um, we got a question that came in from Burton Speakman. He'd like to know how you deal with framing the framing of Marjorie Taylor Greene and her connections to QAnon. Yeah, QAnon. Um, that's been an interesting one. I first met Marjorie when she was running against Karen Handel. Uh, in the Republican primary in the 6th District, which is Metro Atlanta, which is a more moderate, mainstream kind of Republican vibe. And um, her candidacy was going to be all about how she was going to be a mainstream Republican, but she was going to hammer Karen Handel from the right on her votes on the budget. You know, so kind of said, I get it. Um, and then things started coming out um, and I started getting tips about um, her past uh, videos about um, where she made racist and xenophobic comments and some anti-Semitic comments um, as well at like North Fulton County libraries and things like that. Um, and then it quickly came out also about her, um, 
her affiliation and her belief in the QAnon conspiracy theory. Um, so as that started getting more attention, uh, our editors and we decided that we've got to, we've got to, we can't, we're not pulling any punches. We're just going to describe her as who she is. Um, she switched races to run for an open Northwest Georgia congressional district. And, um, and really, I wrote the story after she won. Um, she, she called herself the Democrats worst nightmare, but I wrote that she's, she, she's, she could be the Republicans worst nightmare too. I mean, Republican mainstream leaders, um, didn't try to stop her, um, didn't back one of her rivals in a forceful and an aggressive early way, um, kind of, kind of let her fill that vacuum in the Northwest Georgia district. And she spent like, she spent, I mean, it's not a small amount of money, $900,000, but it's not, you know, it's not world change. I mean, in, in races where we're talking about, where we're talking about like hundreds of millions and hundred million dollars plus being spent in the Senate race, um, you know, that's a drop in the bucket. Um, so it's not like she had some unbeatable advantage, uh, but she was able to come in and win a very crowded, um, get, get to a runoff in a very crowded district and just trounce uh, her Republican opponent in the runoff. And Republicans who I talked to, and I'm talking about top Republican officials, elected leaders, uh, were afraid to um, publicly, as much as they were worried about her rhetoric and all that, they were afraid to go against her. And um, it, uh, it, it, it made for some interest. And then we became, you know, as usual, um, in, in the Trump era, like for candidates channeling the president, like they go after the liberal media, the mainstream media, whatever they want to call us. Um, and so in a very real sense, um, we became uh, part of the story and, and the enemies and such. And uh, it was very, one of the most surreal experiences I've, I've ever had covering anything was um, her, uh, the night of the August, I think it was August 11th runoff. I went to her opponent's party first, but she was expected to win. So I usually go to the opponent's first and then I go to who I think is going to be the winner's party second. Um, little did I know that apparently the winner, Marjorie Taylor Greene's party was closed to the press. There's no signs. There's nothing. I just walked in. I you know, wasn't hiding. And so I start live tweeting what she's saying. And her campaign manager walks over and says, you're out of here. You're not allowed in here. So I live tweeted that too. I said, the AJC reporter just got kicked out um, after, after um, Marjorie Taylor Greene called Nancy Pelosi a bitch. Um, and uh, several of her supporters walked out with me and were kind of like laughing at you know, how silly it was that they kicked me out. Um, but that's just how, that's just where we are right now in some, in some political circles. Um, so yeah, we, we've been reporting on her, on her QAnon adherence. We've been reporting on her remarks. Um, it's less of a story now than it was a month ago, especially since her, her democratic opponent is no longer the race. So she's, she's not, she was already heavily favored to win, but now she's got no opponent period. Um, but, um, it puts us in a position sometimes too. When we become part of the story, we have no opinion of being part of that story. Um, I don't know. Since all this happened, she went on Fox News after after she won the run off. I don't believe the human. You know, I don't believe it. Um, she had never said that during the campaign when, it, when, it, when her comments mattered even more, right? Um, and uh, had when asked directly. The debates would either sidestep the question or ignore completely. And so now she's she's worried about being labeled the Q candidate, you know, the Q congressional member, and facing repercussions in 2022 from the Republican uh, But it's kind of like, you know, just because you said something after you won the race doesn't mean that we, we, we now don't want to call you. We, we, we still have the right to say that you believe this and you still buy this belief for the entire campaign just because you say now. I take all that. It's not so easy to have. Thank you, Greg. I think we lost maybe a last couple sentences there. We we started getting um started getting a little in and out there, but hopefully everyone heard most of what you just said. Um, our next question is coming in from Alexa. Alexa says. I'm trying to use my current location in Georgia to my advantage. Any tips on profiling the district that will elect Marjorie Green? Also, Jeremy Redmond says, hello. I skipped his class today to be here. Okay, yeah, you're a little in and out there. I'm just trying to profile the district that will elect Marjorie Green, the 14th district. Right. 
Greg, you just dropped for a second. Can you mute and unmute your mic and maybe it'll kind of reset your sound? Okay. Do you want me to reread the question? So Alexa says, I'm trying to use my current location in Georgia to my advantage. Uh, Gary says, maybe you should pivot to your hotspot, Greg. It, it seems like your connection might be off a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Let me try this. We'll pause for two seconds. Yeah. All right. We'll go upstairs. Sorry about this, guys. You get to see well, my house. Greg's going upstairs. If, uh, if any other students have questions, now's a good time to drop them in there. Okay. Can you hear me? Kids in the background? We can. <laughs> but it seems to be maybe clear. Okay. Shh. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my own. I can We're all family uh, friendly here, Greg. So we, we're yeah. we're fine with uh, children photobombing our uh, our lunch and learn here. No worries. There we go. Sorry. No. I'm gonna change the hotspot. Okay. Uh, to, um, okay. Can better. you hear us? Okay, Greg. The choice of baby. It might not be perfect, but hopefully it will work this time. So Alexa um, says, I'm trying to use my current location in Georgia to my advantage. Any tips on profiling the district that will elect Marjorie Green? Oh, yeah, that's a fun one. Um, do you want to profile Marjorie Taylor Green? Um, well, part of the issue here is that she is not taking any more interviews, um, as far as I know. Um, like she won't talk to us anymore. Um, I've had just today, I've gotten two or three more calls from net international media who are asking me one from one from the Netherlands and one from, I think Australia who want to go see if she has any events coming up. Um, so it's, you can, it'll be very hard to profile her, um, through an interview, but that's not to say it can't be done because you can still profile folks. Um, uh, without having direct access to them. And one of the ways you do that is just going up to the district, interviewing people around her, um, uh, interviewing her supporters, um, trying to interview people who knew her growing up, who uh, maybe were her, her teachers, her, her political allies, that kind of thing, her surrogates. Um, that's one way. Um, and also going to her campaign events. It's a lot harder for a candidate to say no to an interview in person uh, than it is on through an email. So go find her rallies, go find the next time she's going to go speak or at, at a Habersham County breakfast or whatever it is, go up there. Um, and be, even if you can't get, because that happens to us more than you think. I mean, there's a lot of times where we just, we can't get uh, even the AJC, even a professional outlet, even CNN or whoever, don't get the interviews. Um, and they have to rely on just comments at a public forum or something like that. Um, so that's usually the first thing I will do, though, is try to go see the candidate in action. Try to go see the candidate at a at a Republican rally, at a at a breakfast meeting, at wherever they were. Um, she's doing less of them now that she's won. Uh, she's pretty much won the race, uh, but she's still doing some of them. And then go and talk to voters. And you know, I'll try to talk to 15, 20 voters. I might only use one or two quotes, um, but I'll try to talk to as many as I can. And I'll, I'll also keep some um, for. Uh, for future stories, because you never know when when like those other 18 quotes might come in handy. I hope that answered it, and sorry for the internet delay. You're much clearer now, though, so I'm glad you were able okay. to. See, this is what happens when I go upstairs. <laughs> it was almost like once you got reconnected and your your ear pods, it got reconnected, everything worked so much better. So. Cool. Or clear now. So Addison says, you mentioned that there are quite a lot of stories being written about Georgia as a toss-up purple state. What advice do you have for approaching such an often covered topic with fresh angles and ideas? Yeah, that's a great question because it's one I deal with all the time. You know, you can't write that 
Georgia is a toss-up state anymore uh, without giving it some sort of new twist. Uh, one of the ways to do it is do it through your audience. Um, you know, Georgia's a toss-up state, but what do what do polls say about college students or students or, or people under the age of 25 or you know whatever? And there's lots of data right now too. The beauty of this race is there are so many polls right now. There's like a poll a day, and a lot of them they, they're called cross tabs, but a lot of them have um, very particular information about how young students, how younger voters are thinking, or about if you're writing for an older audience. You know, the CNN has a national poll out today that shows Trump is starting to lose among seniors which is crazy, right? I mean, Republicans have always dominated among seniors. So um, find that angle, um, find that local way in. Um, another, another possibility is like, you, you look for a hook. Um, Jill, Jill Biden, President, uh, Joe Biden's wife, is uh, Vice President Biden's wife is coming to town uh, on Monday. Uh, Monday's also the, the, the first day of early voting. So like you've got these, I, she might come to Cobb County. I mean, if I were advising her, I'd probably tell her to come to Cobb or Gwinnett. So we don't know exactly where she's coming yet, but those are also ways you can get into the story. Um, any focus that the candidates are putting on on your community in particular are ways. And again, it doesn't have to be super local. It could be like a facet of the campaign that you feel like is being undercovered. And there's lots, right? There's just, there's, there's vast parts of this. There's lots of room for stories right now, um, you know, that, that, don't have to focus on Georgia being battleground. It can mention high up in the story that Georgia is a battleground. That could be the, the sort of the cornerstone of the, fo of the of why you're writing the story, but it doesn't have to be the focus of the story. Does that make sense? Greg, thank you for talking about that. Um, Claire Goforth, one of our reporters, is actually responding to a comment from Burton Speakman. Burton says the only outlet covering um, her referencing back to Mar Marjorie Green um, is a site, a citizen journalism site, and the author seems to be someone from her campaign. And a couple of people are wanting to know the link for that source. So Burton, if you have that source, please drop it in here. It seems like some folks are interested in that. I'm um, looking it up right now. Thank you, Burton. Um, we have not gotten any more questions coming in. So if y'all have questions, please do drop them in. I'm gonna turn it back over to Gary for any other questions he had before we um, finish up for the day. Oh, Alexa, I saw you skip Jeremy Redmond's class. I cannot believe that. <laughs> yes, he said uh, attendance is important, but say hi to him for me. So I had there to you go. <laughs> I work with Professor Redmond all the time. Um, and hold on, Nicole. Um, I'm on a class. If you want to come over and say hi. Um, my, my third grade, my fourth grader wants to come over. Um, and then you've got one of these questions too. Does this feel right to you or are the polls off about the recent Q poll? Um, the, the thing about polls that we all should remember is um, taking in isolation, they can be outliers, but if, 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 if polls start all saying the same kind of thing over and over again, that's when you know there's, they're, they're onto something. And that Quinnipiac poll uh, that showed a 50, 50 to 47 Biden, which means tie because it's within the margin of error, um, that echoes like every other poll that I've seen, including the AJC poll, including the WSB poll that came out last week. And so um, one could be an outlier, but like 12 of them saying the same thing, um, that, that's a trend. And I'll add this, Republicans, their internal polls, which are like their personal like, campaign polls that are meant for private uses, but sometimes get leaked to me, uh, they all say the same thing too. Um, that's when you know that these polls are legit. We have a new question from Addison, uh, I think is great um, for if you want to address that. Do you see that, Greg? Yes. How, how are you dealing with all the misinformation that exists around absentee ballots? And how are you planning on covering the fact that we may not have a winner election night this year? Those are two big ones. So first of all, luckily at the AJC, and I, I, I'd, I'd advise any outlet, big or small, to do this. Um, we, a while ago, figured that we would have like a, a voting reporter who only who basically you know, his main focus is elections and, and, and not the politics side of it like me, but like the actual mechanics of it. Um, Nicole, stop. Uh, and, um, and so Mark Nisi does that for us and um, he does a really good job of it. And there's my other daughter. Um, so, um, so we have him and like, he's right now working on a big story about early voting on Monday and how, um, and if Georgia's up for the task, right? Um, 
So how we deal with misinformation is we try to put, put out the truth as much as we can. And I don't get in Twitter fights with people. I don't like, you know, tweet over to President Trump saying, you're wrong, you know, because it just does, I don't feel like that that's effective. Instead, we have a ton of stories right now, um, including like two today, I think, from Mark, that just go over how the absentee ballot process works, uh, answers questions. We do lots of FAQs. We do Facebook Lives. We do we do like community conversations like this um, where, where readers can ask us questions. Um, and I think that helps. It's not going to be a silver. There's so much misinformation out there. There's just there's bound to be disenfranchisement. People who 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 get the wrong and it's just it's disheartening. Um, but we try to do our best um, to counter that. In terms of how we cover the election, I mean, we we kind of have a um, a head start on this because in 2018 we had a 10 day sort of period of purgatory where neither Brian Kemp Brian Kemp had, had declared victory two or three days afterwards, but Stacey Abrams still hadn't um, ended her campaign. So like we're kind of used to, and no one had called the race officially. So like we, we kind of know that's, we kind of have a strong feeling that we're gonna replay that. Um, I'll have all sorts of prep stories ready on Tuesday night, November 3rd, but I don't think I'll be able to write them, right? I mean, I have Trump wins Georgia or, or Clinton, uh, or Clinton, Biden wins Georgia, uh, just like I had four years ago. Um, but I think this will be election week. And I think that basically we'll have to have running stories about, about, um, about tallying absentee ballots and reminding readers that no, the tallies of absentee ballots that are still being calculated aren't ballots that are mysteriously showing up at polling places, you know, five days after the election. They are ballots cast by yours and my neighbors that are now just being counted. Um, and that's just part of the issues that we're going to have because um, I, a lot of people have written about this, but I totally believe it could happen, is a very close race. Uh, poll after poll shows that Republicans are more likely to vote in person than Democrats. So, so election night, we might see um, very important states like Georgia and other states where Republicans might, might have a lead, but, but national networks aren't calling them yet because absentee ballots, which, which tend to lean Democratic, not always, but tend to lean Democratic, haven't been counted yet. Um, and the worry is that President Trump and his allies will be pressuring these, these news outlets to make the call and he'll declare himself very incomplete tallies. Um, and it's up to us to, um, to just write what's happening. And I'm not saying taking sides. I'm just saying, hey, you know, there's still 350,000 absentee ballots left in Georgia. And exit polls showed that you know 55% of them could be Democrat, uh, and and not saying that that means a Democrat will win. That just means that we, we can't call the race yet, and we had to do that with the um, with the Kemp Abrams situation a lot. So at, le at least we've we've been there before here. My daughter's going to tennis. Thank you, thank you for explaining um, a really great perspective on how how to handle this situation. Um, Greg, Gary is wanting to know, where will you be on election night? Good question. I usually um, like being um, with the candidates. I don't like being in the office, eating the pizza with everyone else. I think it's cool that we have like a big operation. Um, in 16 on election, on the actual November election night, I was in the office. Um, but pretty much every other election up until this year, I've been out with one of the campaigns. Um, I think... Um, if I had my druthers, I'd, pro I'd probably be at the Kelly Leffler campaign this time around because I think she's the story, whether she wins or loses. Um, be, you know, in, in her special election race against 20 other candidates. So my gut is to go there. Um, but I also don't know if my editors will want me just back in Atlanta. Um, this June was the weirdest primary election ever because, um, you know, I was able to like put my kids to bed and then go downstairs and work till whatever. You know, five a. I think I pulled an all nighter. I, unfortunately, all nighters are the are the becoming the norm in Georgia politics. Can you speak to voter suppression in Georgia? And I think you know tackling that question in context of really the role that turnout's going to play, uh, the youth vote, the black vote, and just. The suppression overall affect the outcome. If you want to talk a little bit about that, wrap up our conversation. Yeah, and an important lesson to remember about voter suppression is it's not just overt, right? Uh, there are overt forms of voter suppression, and Democrats point to 
um, voter ID and and you know other other barriers that they say put put voters between themselves and the polls. But there's also sort of the more tacit forms of voter suppression, and that could be just mismanagement, incompetence. Um, uh, in in a state like Georgia, the Repu the Secretary of State can oversee elections, but it's up to local county officials to to administer them, to execute them. Um, and in 2018, we saw all sorts of problems, especially in, and this is where like student journalists can really step in, but we saw all sorts of problems in local counties, in, in, in particularly in Gwinnett County and DeKalb County and Fulton County, where like plugs went missing. So computer ballot voting machines couldn't be plugged in. And, um, you know, just not enough poll workers at certain sites and all this. And unfortunately, in June of this year, after all those lessons learned from 2018 and all these changes and, and a new voting system that was supposed to help speed up tabulation, um, we saw voters wait five, six, seven hours to cast their ballots. And, and you know, it might not be uh, the same as a poll tax, but to many people, it might as well be. Um, right. That, that is a form of voter suppression is requiring voters to stand for five, six, seven hours to cast their ballots. Um, because frankly, I was there. I was out at a, a Cross Keys High School in DeKalb interviewing voters who had waited at that point two or three hours to cast their ballots. And they, they were really great. I mean, they were I was they're really admirable for sitting there in the hot sun waiting for three or four hours to cast their ballots. But I kept on looking at the cars going by and wondering how many people saw that long line and said, screw it, I'm not going to vote. And that's the worry for November, right? Um, and the the thing, the takeaway I had from that, two of them, one, that when people show up with lawn chairs to vote as a voting accessory, you know there's a problem, right? If you feel like you have to bring a chair with you in order to cast your ballot, then something's up. Um, and secondly, as I was reporting all this, I was getting texts from the Secretary of State's office attacking you know, local elections officials for the long way. And I was getting, and local elections officials were blaming the state. The voters I care, I talked to who were waiting on them, they didn't care about the finger pointing. All they wanted to do was cast their ballot. And it was so, it was so um, dispiriting to see that. It was so depressing to kind of see that. All these guys wanted to do was to vote, ex exercise their constitutional right to, to have their choice in a democracy. Um, and they didn't care about you know, Brad Raffensperger saying that the Cab County officials dropped the ball. It's fun to vote. Um, and I hope and pray that uh, that Georgia's got its act together. And I'm talking about county and state alike, um, starting on Monday when early voting starts, um, because there's going to be a huge demand. We're going to have 5 million people turn out, expected as 5 million people, by far a record in Georgia. Already, already the number of mail-in ballots has exceeded the entire number of mail-in ballots in 2016 which was a high turnout election too. That just shows you the extent of, of interest around this race and, and energy around this race. So yeah, I hope we have our act together. And um, I hope lessons are learned too to lawmakers about how they can go and, and attack, not just the explicit, because you know, it's rarely gonna be as explicit as it was, to, thank God, as, this, you know, as it was during the civil rights era, but there are definitely implicit forms of voter suppression that are still that are still threats to democracy today. Greg, thank you so much for all of that. I, and I just want to thank everybody else for joining us for this conversation today. Um, I, I do. I feel like we could continue this for hours this afternoon because there's just so many layers to Georgia politics right now. And as a former Floridian, I welcome you to the chaos. You know, we're used to blowing elections for the country and, you know, it's a fun space to be in. <laughs> Um, you probably have a few uh, all-nighters ahead of you, but you know we really value your time that you spent with us today. And just most importantly, you know, for the students that came in today and asked you know such great questions about how they get into this line of work, you know, we need students that, to follow your path. We yes. need students to get involved in political reporting and journalism, and really just help you know uh, democracy prevail. So. Um, I would encourage all of our students on there to reach out to your professors, reach out to your mentors, reach out to professionals like Greg and make these you know, networks and connections so you can get the invaluable experience to get started uh, because we need you and democracy needs you. And I think Georgia is going to be a really interesting place to cover politics for the foreseeable future. And I just threw my uh, email address out there. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, during normal times, I often have students uh, shadow me and come come out and go to campaign events. There's not as many campaign events, and shadowing is 
different now in the pandemic era, but um, there will be plenty of things to cover. I'm happy to help uh, you guys as you progress in your careers too. Oh, thank you so much, Greg. Chelsea, you wanna wrap us up here? Yes, Greg, thank you seriously so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We're getting um, lots of comments of different folks saying thank you um, from a student perspective and thank you from some of our readers of our publications. They're saying thank you. Um, our team is saying thank you and some folks from KSU that are staff members just from not a student perspective, but just a Georgia voters perspective. Thank you for, for coming and talking so that we um, are are um, better equipped to go into this election season and just understand from your perspective um, what we're looking at. So, so we thank you. Um, and for anyone that is a student at KSU that's interested in getting involved with the work that we're doing at the Center for Sustainable Journalism, um, you all have our contact information um, through the, the event information today. So please do let us know if you're interested in learning more about getting involved, and we'd be happy to, to, to discuss that with you. Um, so thank you all so much, and um, we hope to see you all at our next event. Great, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Greg. Greg. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.